Yes, hello, I'm Susan Thorne. I translate German to English. And I may be being less anecdotal than my uh, colleagues here on the panel. Um, and wanted to pass along a few pointers just uh, for those times when I have them, and I'm sure you do too. When you finish the project, you're ready to start something new, translate something new, what will it be? And poss very likely you have something in mind, but uh, sometimes I don't, or the, uh, the text I was excited about six months ago doesn't appeal to me quite as much. I'm looking for something. Uh, I'm shopping around for a project. And uh, to jumpstart your brainstorming, I could suggest uh, one thing that helps me, keeping a list of what I've read. Uh, because, uh, you know, having recall or, or calling up things that I read years ago uh, that might be very good choices for a current project, uh, that, that can be difficult. So, um, you know, systematically, whether it's in the computer or whatever, keeping a, a record of uh, works that you already know and, and might want to go back to. Um, and keeping a record of works that you've heard about or read about that, that piqued your interest, that you might want to work with. Um, might be sticking book reviews in a folder and you go look at them you know, at a time of need when you're wanting to uh, identify a new translation project, or a work that interests you. Um, if you translate contemporary lit literature, um, there are websites to consult and publications with information about new resources, re new releases, and uh, I might go to these. There's new books in German that the uh, <coughs> Day produces, um, sorry, the Goethe Institute uh, publishes regularly. There's a website called literaturecritique.com that, uh, that will email you uh, regular releases about new books with reviews of them so you can assess a little bit of what they're like, whether you might like them. Um, and I know there are other national government agencies, like in Norway and Austria have them, for example, that will put out regular inter internet lists of new publications in those languages. Um, you can also look at publishers' websites, uh, see what they're doing, um, check out their offerings, and they often have links to book reviews that would let you form some idea about the text. Um, and there's a particular issue that I run into with German, and some of you may share this, but others may not. Um, it's the problem that German is a language with a fairly wide exposure in English translation, um, relatively speaking. I mean, historically, the German classics have been you know, widely read, studied. There are um, uh, academic departments devoted to this. so. Um, and more modern canoni canonical works too, you know, Kafka, Grass, and others um, are pretty well represented in English translation, so compared with many other languages. So if your source language is one like this with fairly wide currency in English translation, uh, you may need to do some digging to find a work you engage with that hasn't already been translated. And I don't, I don't know how many times I've become excited about a, a novel or a short story and then only to realize that it's out there in the, in the bookshops already. So checking, checking with websites like UNESCO's uh, Index Translatonium, Translatorium or uh, the University of Rochester uh, site for more recent, the most recent works um, could spare you that, that pain. Um, and so finding a new project may require you to get off the beaten track a bit. Um, if you have a favorite author, I'd suggest looking around for lesser known works by that writer or maybe something that has been written in, in a genre that is less, not associated so much or not as, as well known for that author. For example, Kafka's diaries or Hertha Müller's travel writings or someone's children's book that is, uh, is not widely known, um, may have been overlooked. Uh, I find wandering the stacks of the local university, if you've got a good, if they have good holdings in your, your language area, um, you can turn up some, some fines there and you can assess them on the spot. It has that advantage. Um, 
And one potential source of works that may have been overlooked by even well-known authors are anthologies. Uh, sometimes they're along genre lines, um, you know, or a theme, the Czech short story, or the Russian descriptive essay, something like that. Um, I have a book, uh, a fairly old anthology, Der Wald, you know, the woods or, or the forest, um, that has a story by Friedrich Nietzsche that is a fairly conventionally romantic story from, from his youth, <coughs> before Nietzsche became Nietzsche, really, um, that I'm translating. And I think this, this may be of, of some interest as to a publication. Um, and that came out of this rather, rather old, battered paperback found in a, in a secondhand book sale. So things can turn up in unexpected places. And I wouldn't even rule out uh, academic anthologies, you know, dis books that discuss a theme and include excerpts that might um, identify a good, you know, a longer work that would interest you. Um, so these are some approaches that have, have helped me and um, might be of interest to you. And um, I, I think now it's time to hear from the others about particular instances of <coughs> of finding texts. I have a sort of two opposite examples, I think, of how texts have come to me. Um, I must say I probably am incredibly new at this. I was at Alta for the first time last year with um, having just started really in translation. Um, and I had two projects, um, and it came to me in different ways. I translate order why in poetry. So I translate poetry from the smallest Spanish-speaking country in South America. Um, and uh, my first project um, uh, is translating the poetry of Cerce Maya, who is 82 and is one of the leading poets in Uruguay and one of the generation that includes, and I guess the best known name in America now would be Eduardo Galeano, who's the last living one of that generation, and Cerce. And, um, and I came across her because I had been in Uruguay for my sabbatical year. I went back down to visit some friends over Three Kings, over Epiphany, staying with them at the beach. They knew I'm a poet. I love poetry. Um, I had been reading Mario Benedetti and other other Uruguayan poets, and um, in my shoe and the three kings, you know, the, the 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 three kings come by and they leave presents in the shoes of children. But anyway, my shoe, I got the complete works of Cerce Maya, the complete poetry of Cerce Maya, 400 pages, um, because she is from a town, Tacuarembó, um, what my friend was from, and so I just sat there in the hammock at the beach and I couldn't stop reading these poems. I just fell absolutely in love with it. Just you know, the, this is love at first sight. Um, and when I got back, I started translating a few just for myself and looking around to see what I was sure would be lots of translations and found out there are just a few in a couple of anthologies. Um, and so it's order way. So you ask the first person you know, you know how to get in touch with uh, Cerce Maya. And in this case, they knew. And if they didn't, you'd ask the second person and they would know. Um, but I had great luck because um, she immediately responded warmly. I said, I'd really like to translate a few things, just send them out to literary journals in the United States. I wish people knew your work better. She said, how lovely. Um, please do. And so um, uh, first, first problem, there was no problem getting agreement for the person to do it. The response was so immediate. Um, editors that I've worked with as a poet for years who routinely turned me down and or take six months to sit on my work answered you know, on a Sunday night and said yes to her poetry. Um, mm -hmm. And um, Paul Muldoon took one for the New Yorker. And so um, I began to get more excited about it and translate more work. Um, and then I moved on to go ahead and get a book contract for that. The Selected Poems is going to be coming out from the University of Pittsburgh Press. So that was just the happy happenstance of, you know, I've met her now, I, I know her. There, was, there are other ways this could go, including having fallen in love with a book and someone else is already bringing out a book and so, someone else has the rights, all those things. But that was me finding a passion at, just by finding a book, like you're talking about. Um, the other was the idea first. I decided to do an anthology of younger Uruguayan poets, poets under 40. Um, and so I just deliberately set out to stalk them. Um, and this can be done um, really amazingly well from far away these days. So I started contacting the uh, poets that I could see, had, uh, young Uruguayan poets doing things online or that someone mentioned to me, another poet I knew, an older poet, and I would email them or contact them on Facebook. And when you contact a young poet, you know, a poet, 25-year-old poet, and you say, I might be using five poems in an anthology, they send you like three manuscripts. Bam, just bam, attached to it. <laughs> so um, no rights problems, no, you know, they'll, they'll, whatever. So, um, so then I went down to Uruguay, and I went to readings, and I met more poets. 
had an event where you know I met all the poets um, in one place and told them about the anthology. In the end, I had 65 poets for, to pick for the 22. Um, so I, I, I think that um, sometimes it would be probably uh, be hard to go right away, maybe and take this 25-year-old person's work and translate it as a, as a <coughs> single poetry collection and, and have it published in quite the same way as Cerse Maya. But by doing this anthology, a uh, great response from the poets, um, contract for the book, it's coming out from the University of New Mexico Press. Um, so, um, um, but in that case, it was like just the concept first. You know, I teach young poets here. I knew there were young poets in Ordway, and then I went to find them. And those are my two anecdotes of how work has come to me. Well, I too will be anecdotal and kind of on the same side of things as Jesse. Um, I think the word search appears in this description, but so does the word find, and find is the side of things that I'm on, or rather being found. Um, I think like many people, I was a poet for many, many years before I ever even thought about translating. And the way I came to it is the way I know a lot of people came to it. I was reading a bilingual edition of a Latin American poet who shall remain unknown, <laughs> unnamed, so that the translator can. And I said to myself, gosh, I could do better than that. Um, and uh, so I just started working on these poems. I had a Spanish minor in college. I dusted off my college Spanish and uh, just started working. I had no intention of publishing. I have not published these poems. I could not publish these poems if I wanted to. Uh, I'll say another word about that at the end. Um, but it was what I sort of consider my translation adolescence. And that will be the beginning of a metaphor that I carry on for the next couple of minutes. Um, what happened next was what I would call dating. And I should <laughs> emphasize that this is a metaphor uh, and will continue to be so. So my first serious dating was with um, the poems of a German poet, Richard Dexner, whom I met at the McDowell Colony when I was in residence writing poems. Uh, we exchanged poems. I realized that our poems had quite a lot in common. So I dusted off my college German. Uh, I'd spent uh, a semester in Germany when I was in college, and worked on those poems for a while, published a number of them, including a chapbook book long length poem. I don't know that I ever had an intention of going on past there, but it lasted for a while. In the meantime, I had a number of, shall we say, one night stands, uh, <laughs> where uh, a Spanish poem would come my way and look very attractive, or another German poem. I even had a blind date, blind in a couple of senses. One was that a friend fixed us up and said, can you do this for my anthology? And the other was that my French is pretty terrible. Um, but at least so far, I knew something about all the languages I was translating from. My second uh, serious dating uh, coincided with my learning of Italian. And my friend um, and teacher, teacher in quotation marks because our class was very casual, gave me the poems of Dacia Marini. And they were, they're short little things. They're really quite delightful. And uh, just working on those got me, it, it coincided with my learning of the language. It helped me learn the language. I was having a fine time with them. I published a whole bunch of them in magazines. Thought I might go on with that. And then I fell in love. Now, metaphor, right? Not with the poet, but with the poems. Um, and like a great deal of falling in love, it was totally inappropriate. Which is to say that whereas I had known something about these other languages, I knew not a word of Vietnamese, which is what this person spoke. So a little background about how that happened. It was quite serendipitous. Um, I was teaching at UMass Boston, directing creative writing program. Uh, the director of something called, now called the Joyner Institute for the Study of War and Social Consequences came to my office one day and asked if I would like to collaborate a little bit because they had a writer's workshop. Now the Joyner Center was founded in the 1980s by veterans. And of course in the 1980s that meant Vietnam vets. So it was just about the time that things were loosening up in Vietnam. So they started this workshop. In the beginning, uh, the, the faculty were people like Bruce Weibel and Tim O'Brien. Um, and there were writers always coming from Vietnam. When it opened up a little bit, I was asked to teach. And I was asked to teach, of all things, 
of all things, translation. Uh, I, uh, how did I teach, how would I teach translation? I had no idea. I had done the things I described. But I agreed, and the first year I was there, I met a poet named Nguyen Quang Thiel, who brought three um, of his poems translated into kind of bad English, um, but it was good enough that I could see the poem underneath his English. And I was hooked. I, I was in love. And I thought, OK, no more Italian, at least for the time being. And this was 1993, so I'd been at this for a good long time. Um, as it turned out, I did not <coughs> fall in love sufficiently to become fluent in Vietnamese, though I had fantasies of doing that. I took a year of Vietnamese at Harvard. I can get along. Uh, I can read poems. Um, but I make terrible mistakes, so I'm completely um, dependent on my co-translator, whoever that may be. But um, it's become a significant part of my life, and it just kind of happens. Uh, not something I searched for. Uh, the last thing in the world I needed was something else to do in my life. So the idea of translating anything was just, why would I bother with that? And then here I, here I come to a language I don't even know. Uh, it's enriched me enormously, the very fact that it's a language I didn't know anything about, that it's an Asian language that does not act like a European language uh, was pretty wonderful. I was very fortunate uh, in easily getting the rights to these poems. And I do want to say something. I, I greatly advise falling in love. If you are going to translate a book, particularly of poems, poems are really sort of intense. If you're, if you're getting paid money, you can translate anything. But, but if you're getting, if you're translating poems, you can't. So I really do. Fold it up metaphorically. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, let's drop the metaphor. OK, no more metaphor. Um, but I, I recently was in contact with a former student who, who indeed fell in love with a text and discovered that she couldn't publish the translations because she did not have permission. So you've got to get what, what to say, the parental permission for uh, this marriage to, to go ahead. So that's my story. Well, I'm in a great position because I've heard everyone else. And I mm -hmm. have to pick up the key phrases that I think matter <clears throat> from my point of view, just from my own experience. Happy happenstance, uh, finding or being found. I like the phrase, just kind of happened, because that sounds so unprofessional. <laughs> and it is. It's unprofessional. But once it just kind of happened, you make it professional. So uh, to take a, an image, I think it was Goethe, but I'm not sure. Somebody said, the difference between everyone else and a writer is that as the writer walks along, He's carrying a little notebook and a pencil. Well, a translator is, is, could be any traveler, let's say. But you have to be on the TV. If you have to have your eyes and your ears open, you have to be ready to receive. Actually, Christ said it better than Goethe. Christ said, many are called, but few are chosen. Has anyone ever looked into what could that possibly mean? It sounds so nasty. Many are called, few are chosen. I think what, what Christ meant is, many are called, and very few listen. You see. So what really happens, and my experience is always traveling, okay? So I can't, uh, I feel that Miss, uh, Susan, Susan? Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Susan's was a very useful uh, <clears throat> opening for people who, let's say, are here. They're in their university. They're stuck wherever they are. And what do they have? They have books and they have the internet. And I do kind of the opposite. I just go somewhere. And so I can tell you a lot about that. If you go to a small country, it's a lot easier. If you go to a small country, you meet one poet, and within a few Excuse months, you're going to know everybody in the whole country. Go to Washington. <laughs> yeah. It's a huge advantage. Then you still will have to pick whom do you feel most sympathy for, most uh, sympathetic with their work, right? But the small country is a great advantage. A huge country like Brazil, is, it's, really, it's really a problem. It's, it's, it's enormous. And the serendipitous nature of these encounters becomes even more important in a place like Brazil. So I end up devoting, this started seven years ago, and I'll be working on, with this guy the rest of my life, or at least the next five, six years. So that's 13 years with one poet in Brazil. It's complete. It's pretty much an accident. I didn't pick him. Somebody else picked him, and that's somebody else I had respect for. And the, the person said to me, this is whom you should be translating. This is the most important voice amongst contemporary poets. And this guy, Salgado Marañón, was so difficult that when I started reading it, I, my first uh, instinct was to run, because I didn't think I could handle it. But the, uh, the head of uh, 
uh, Portuguese Brazilian studies at Brown said, you're the only person, you're the only person who can possibly translate this guy. So flattery, <coughs> flattery will turn anyone into a slave. <laughs> so he not only flattered me, he then invited Saldado Marañón to a conference at Brown, all the way from Brazil, and he invited me, and we met, and I really liked the guy. He's a really great guy. And so that made it easier, and then we began to discover things that we had in common, um, and, uh, and we began to work together, together. And that's one aspect that I want to talk about. I think collaborative, even if you don't call it a collaboration, even if the book doesn't say, uh, uh, see, some Adam Sorkin's books always say translated by Adam Sorkin and, or translated by Adam Sorkin with. And I've had the strange experience, most of the people don't want it done that way, most of the people I work with. And they feel that the English is entirely my responsibility, but they're very willing to help nudge me along the way. Okay? So even a language I know well, like Portuguese, I want to be nudged along the way, because I always have doubts. And when it's a language I don't know well, like Spanish, I really, really work very hard to make up for my deficiencies by wringing the poet dry. I mean, I just grab hold of them and, and ask a million questions until they're almost dead. And then I have a book, a good book. Um, now, serendipity is the key thing. But it's serendipity plus character. You have to pounce. When, when, if you're walking down the street and, and there happens to be a $10 bill on the ground, you can keep walking if you're a noble person, or if you're an ignoble translator, you can pounce on the $10 bill and grab it. And you have to do that as a translator. You're traveling in a foreign country, you meet people, you like someone, then they hand you a book, you start reading it, and you see something you like, you gotta begin, you gotta do it, and you gotta go back, you gotta call them up, visit them, start working with them. People will work with you usually, because, and this is not nice, this is the way the world is, a colonial, you know, America, English, and all this, well, America has been dominating the world in the 20th century the way England did in the 19th, and it's not a pretty thing to look at, but it's a reality. Therefore, almost anyone from a small country like Uruguay or, or Ecuador is going to be delighted that you're translating them. They think that you are opening the door to the world for them. Because without you, they can only be known in, in, in Montevideo, in Bucharest, in, uh, what was my other small country? Um, oh, oh, or in Guayaquil. The people in Guayaquil can't even be known in Quito. Because Quito is the capital and wants to ignore Guayaquil. <laughs> but if they get, can get hold of me, or if I offer to translate them, they think that they can actually be discovered by the world. And to a very small degree, it's true. I mean, you know, 300 people, 600 people, maybe if you're lucky, 1,000 people will buy the book and and so you have, in a way, made it into the world. So, so chance. I can just give anecdotes. When I left Brazil, oh, for me, the key thing is traveling. And if you guys are young, if you don't have a million children and all that, uh, I, and, or if you're very old and your children are grown up, <laughs> I would say that the best, most important thing is travel. Go to the country. Spend as much time as you can. So I taught in Brazil for two and a half years. Uh, and, and when I was leaving, my best student gave me a pile of books. She gave me a whole box of books. Got back to America. Couldn't find a job. It was the middle 70s. I'd been out of the country for a few years. I was out of the loop. So I settled down in Greenwich Village and started to translate Clarice Lispector, whom I had never heard of. Well, this is 1974. But I had the book in the carton, two books by Lispector. I started translating them. Everything I sent out got accepted. I didn't receive my first rejection of any translation I ever did until six months had passed. So I was tremendously lucky. I'm not saying I was great. I was just incredibly lucky. I came at a moment when everyone was interested in South America, and nobody, except Gene Longman, nobody was translating anything from Brazil at the time. So I got all this stuff accepted, which is very encouraging. And that's how I became, in, in a sense, a translator. Uh, if everything gets accepted, you, you're pretty happy to be in that rut. You know, it's a good rut. Um, um, okay, so that was just that a student gave me the book. So I translated several of the authors that I found in this carton of books, and the only one uh, that got published in book form was Clarice Lispector. And then uh, a couple, of, two years later, I was on the beach with my little one-year-old son running all over the beach, and a couple of people near us were admiring my son, and uh, particularly the woman was admiring our son. She started chatting with my wife or whatever, my, my son's mother, and. Uh, 
And they started chatting, and it turned out, they said, what are you doing here? And, and, and my son's mother said, well, he, that guy, is, he's, he's translating Portuguese poets. I had come to Portugal to do an anthology of Portuguese poets, but I had just arrived, I hadn't begun. The guy comes back, our husband, it turns out he's a Portuguese poet, and he says, I'm having tea at four o'clock with Alexandre O'Neill, who was really one of the most famous poets at the time in Portugal. Why don't you come and join us? So because of my son running naked, <laughs> or naked he wasn't wow. yet an American. Um, so he was running naked all over the beach. Um, um, thanks to that, I got invited to Alexandre O'Neill's house, and I ended up translating him for years and years and years. And then, a few years later, I came back, I had a grant uh, to translate Sophia de Mello Brenner Anderson, a wonderful, wonderful woman poet, uh, but just a wonderful poet, but she's also the most famous woman of letters, I think, almost in the history of Portugal. Uh, um, in any case, I had a grant to translate her. I arrive in, 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 in Lisbon, I call up, oh, Alexis, how nice to hear from you. I said, well, I'm here, when can we begin? And I had planned the whole thing with her half a year earlier. She said, begin, oh yes, yes, well, tomorrow I'm going to a wedding. And I said, well, how about the day after tomorrow? Oh, the day after tomorrow I'm leaving for Greece. I said, well, when are you coming back? She said, three months from now. <laughs> so I was left with a big grant and nobody to translate. And some guys said to me, why don't you go up to Porto and translate Eugenio de Andrade? Um, he's always at home, he never goes anywhere, and he's a very vain man, he'll be delighted to be translated. <laughs> so I went up there and, and, and tried to translate him for the next 25 years. And uh, with the material that I managed to do that first summer, I returned to America, I sent it to my publisher who had given me a contract to do Sophia de Melobrana Anderson. And he said, oh, I like this guy even better. And he changed the contract, he published Eugenio, it was my first book, Sophia didn't talk to me for 10 years. She was so angry. But um, these, these, are, these are the little things that happen. And, and uh, Ecuador, I, my, my language is Portuguese, but um, um, eight years ago a colleague from the Spanish department said, uh, tell me, what do you think of this? And handed me a bunch of poems to read in English. And they were terrible, just really terrible. The kind of thing you guys didn't, didn't want to talk about. Terrible translations. Well, they were translations of excellent Ecuadorian poets by a Bolivian who knew more English than my colleague, but was a foreigner. It wasn't English at all. And he said, are these publishable? I said, no. And he was a pretty tough guy. He, he wasn't afraid of the truth. He said, can they in any way be made publishable? I said, you need a real translator. And he went like this. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, where? He said, how about Guayaquil? I said, well, I'm busy on two other books. Uh, I'm free uh, after Christmas. He said, I'll meet, you. I'll meet you on January 1st in Guayaquil. I said, done deal. And I've been going back to Ecuador every year since. I've been there seven times. I've been to Galap Galapagos five times. And uh, this was the first complete book that came out. But before that, an anthology of 17 poets came out. Th this is completely serendipitous. It was his idea, his desire. He wanted to give some um, relief. Uh, what's the word? Not relief. Uh, shape, silhouette. He wanted to highlight, highlight his uh, poets from his hometown, Guayaquil, because everyone in Quito ignores Guayaquil. Um, and uh, I had no, I'm not Patikris, I'm just his colleague. So I was simply the hired gun who knew English and, and who had a poetic ear, but I was the hired gun. I didn't choose the poets, I didn't choose the poems. He made all the choices, I, I made sure that the results were really good poems in English. And the book was good, it never sold, it was with a, uh, a press that doesn't sell much, but the book looks good, it has a good cover, it, it has good poets in it, and because of working with those 17 poets, I got to meet all of them, and they were delighted. One guy, I went back to Ecuador a year later, and I gave $50 to everybody who, who got published in America through us. And one guy, who was about 75, 80, he took this $50 bill from me, and his eyes filled with tears. And I said, what, what's the matter? He said, this is the first time in my life that I have ever been paid for poetry. So that was really touching, really touching. I was happy to, that I had overcome my stinginess and gave away all the money to the, to the Ecuadorians instead of keeping some of it for myself. So I keep going back to Ecuador. I'm going back uh, on January 1st. 
and I have another Ecuadorian book coming out. So it all started serendipitously because a colleague wanted to get an anthology published, and he suspected that what he had was unpublishable, and he was right, and he suspected that I could make it a real book, and we did. We did it from scratch. We did not work from the bad uh, puppies. You know, that's another thing some of you may have to think about. Do you want to redo something that's already been done and it's bad? If so, I would say start from scratch. Don't look at the bad text in your native tongue. It will only distract you and irritate you and, and maybe pollute you a little bit. Um, um, some of you may have heard of Whereabouts Press. Anyone from San Francisco? Anybody? Nobody. Whereabouts Press. Uh, did you do the Mexican one? Yeah. So Whereabouts Press is an excellent endeavor. Uh, it, the idea is wonderful. The guy should be a millionaire. And of course, nothing happens. Nobody buys the books unless, unless someone like C.M. Mayo is hawking them. Then they really get sold. But it's a wonderful idea. It's called A Traveler's Literary Companion. And what he does is he provides, in English, a book of short stories that represent all the different parts of a country. So it's done geographically. And the idea is that a tourist, a tourist landing in Hamburg will read a story that's set in Blancanesa. And a tourist landing in Munich will read a story set in the English Garten und so weiter. And so I suggested to him, how about Brazil? I had already read the Costa Rica. Anybody? Nobody's in here? Many Alta members contrib contributed to the Costa Rica uh, uh, edition, which was one of the very first. And uh, so I knew about the book series. And I suggested Brazil. And he said, yeah, go ahead. And that was it. I simply had to gather stories. Again, which stories do you gather? It, it's a big question of chance. I cannot give you any guidelines. You, you go to a library, you sit down with a million books, you see what you can find, you call up everybody you know, and, and six months later you end up with a pretty interesting collection with a lot of sex and violence in it, of course, um, because you want it to sell. And with all the sex and violence in it, you manage to sell 350 copies. Um, so I'm, I'm on all in favor of chance. I believe, here's the deal with chance. You have to understand what Heraclitus said um, character is fate. Now here's the deal. If you've just been told by the Delphic Oracle that you're going to kill your father and sleep with your mother, you do not, upon leaving the Oracle, kill the first old man you bump into at the crossroads. <laughs> That's where character becomes fate. For the translator, it's the other way around. When you bump into a poet at the crossroads, you translate him. Do something. Grab hold of him. Don't kill him, translate him. Never um, kill them. In other words, you have to jump up upon, your, upon your chance and turn it into your fate. So those are some anecdotes. Of course, I have many more, but so do we all. <laughs> so does anyone else have something to question? Any comments back and forth on the panel, across the panel, or shall I open up? Let's have some questions. Or anecdotes. A anecdotes? No, Share your anecdotes. anecdotes. <laughs> yes. Well, this is, I, I hate to give Alexis more time to tell <laughs> anyone else, but I, I was struck by, by something uh, that you said, Alexis, by, by, by everything you said, which is the, um, your collaboration with the living translator, because my experience is, is really the opposite, and that when I work with living poets, or when Nicole and I work with a living prose writer, Prose writers just trust us, and that's the end of that. And we will, of course, ask questions, which is very nice to be able to do. We can't do that with someone who's dead. That's very nice. But I wouldn't call that collaboration. Right. And when it's with the, the French, the only French, the only live French poet I've translated, who's an old good friend whose English is awful, but who yeah. reads English fluently, Jean Sapé, yeah. you know, he, thank God, trusts trust trust me and just says, "Have you?" Are you sure that you've got this nuance of my poem? Occasionally, you will say, and that's very helpful. And occasionally, I've you know, made mistakes, and the ones that, that my collaborator in America didn't get. Uh, but I can't imagine collaborating him with him. That would be a, a, a nightmare. Okay. Because his English is, is, is just well. not, he's not a poet in English, he's a poet in French. No, no but I completely, what you're saying is a corrective of great importance, but it has no relevance to my experience because. Believe it or not, the people I've collaborated with don't speak a word of English. That is the advantage. They don't speak a word of English. That's better. So what happens is, 
I go down to a city in the interior of Brazil. It's about 100 degrees. We've got a breeze blowing through our apartment. And my pal Salgado is lying there with almost no clothes on on the couch, his legs dangling over the end of the couch, with utter patience, simply waiting to hear the English of each poem. He knows all his poems by heart, completely, all of them, because he comes from an oral tradition, didn't learn to read and write till he was 15 years old. Um, he knows everything by heart. It's absolutely astonishing. So he's got it all in his head. He lies there in his bathed in patience, and I simply recite in English. So it's all about rhythm. It's all about music. It's all about sound. Now, you might say, well, this is crazy. Look, I think more than half the value of poetry is in the music. That's what I feel. I don't feel it's in the content. If it were in the content, you might as well write prose. In any case, in any case those are the kind of poets I favor, where the music is very important. Eugenio de Andrade, who's world I mean, everyone in Portugal reads him. I, I once got on a train, a night train to the Algarve from Porto, with three girls in my cabin. Uh, uh, already then, 20 years ago, I was much too old for them. But now I, can't, I wouldn't even be able to see them. But or, in any case, there were three girls, medical students, and they said, well, what are you doing in Portugal? And I said, well, I'm translating Eugenio de Andrade. They all threw themselves on me. Ha! Ah, ah, ha! Eugenio de Andrade! <laughs> now, if you read him, he has nothing to say at all. But boy, does he, boy, does he say it well. <laughs> Que manhã queria ainda de areia sobre a boca, de areia. Que manhã queria ainda de areia ou de seda sobre a boca antes de entrar em Itaca. Talking to himself about what does he want from life anymore, as if he were Odysseus. What morning does he wish for still of sand or silk upon the mouth before he enters Ithaca? It's all about the sound. There's nothing happening. And it took me a couple of years to realize that. And, and as we worked together, the collaboration, he didn't speak a word of English. He had no interest in English, strangely enough. But this is how the collaboration would go. He, he'd sit there and he'd recite a poem of his. Que estranho ofício meu Procurar renta chão Uma folha renta chão Procurar entre o sono e a poeira Uma folha, molhado ainda do primeiro sol. And I realized after a while, it took me a year or two, that he was directing his own poems. Okay? So what I translated was his directing. What I tried to do was produce a poem in English that was his musical. So I've chosen poets where the music is the major thing. And I have to say, poet after poet, uh, in the end, they listen to the English, and whether they know the language or not, their final words are so a bang, so a bang. It sounds good. Now, of course you could do something wrong that sounds good. But I hope my Portuguese is good enough so I don't do something wrong. So okay. sound is the key thing that linked me with my so-called collaborators, okay? But when I had a real collaborator, I, I didn't marry her like Nicole, but she was in Montreal an hour away. With her, it was a real collaboration and she refused to let her name be put on any book. She didn't feel her contribution was enough, but she was utterly, she was Portuguese, her English was impeccable, her French was impeccable, uh, even her German was very good, and she understood poetry, so she was absolutely... I thought that I could never work without her. But when she went off to the UN and disappeared into the wilds of Barundi, and where did everybody kill each other? Yeah. <laughs> right next oh, to Barundi. Rwanda. Yeah. Rwanda. She disappeared into Rwanda, Barundi, then she went to Haiti, where all their friends got bumped off in the earthquake, everyone they were working with. Her husband stepped out of his office, and when he came back, the office was gone and everybody was dead, and he survived. Um, so she's gone, I lost her 10 years ago. She's alive, but I lost her as a collaborator, and I thought that I could never go on. And I felt I could only go on by working with the living people. Okay, so it's a different experience. I think Martha wants to get here for a second. <laughs> uh, I am necessarily dependent on a co-translator, not just a collaborator, whose name is always on the book, and who in two out of three cases has been the poet. Um, and to me, it's been invaluable not only because my Vietnamese is insufficient uh, and I make terrible mistakes, but also because the culture is not my culture and there is so much that I don't understand and I don't have a basis for doing that 
The first poet I worked with would draw little diagrams. This is what a buffalo cart looks like. This is what the perch climbing the falls do. This <laughs> is what these fish do. And, and I have this little scrapbook of little drawings that, that he gave to me. I think it depends completely. This is more serendipity, you know. I would not work with somebody. If I started working with somebody and there was tension and the person seemed bossy and was going to tell me how to do it, I would quit. I just wouldn't go any further. So there's always a little testing period. Mm -hmm. But I have been really, really fortunate. The once that I worked with a co-translator who was not the poet, she had a degree in French and English literature. She's a lawyer, but she isn't a poet. But she would say things to me like, hmm, we were translating this woman poet. She'd say, oh, that reminds me a little bit of Emily Dickinson. You can think about it that way. Or um, one of the poets I was translating who knew English said, I said, I couldn't. I couldn't figure out what he was doing, these really unusually long lines. He said, well, I was reading Walt Whitman. I said, oh, I got it. Um, so I have been very fortunate in, in the kind of working relationship I've had. But I think it's like any relationship, you know? Uh, it's got to work. And I, I guess if I'm giving advice and you are going to work with a collaborator or co-translator, be sure that you can work temperamentally. Be sure that before you go too far. Did you say you wanted to add, Susan? But work, work, whether you work with a, um, your translator, um, with, the, with your person um, directly? Have you ever done that? No, I haven't worked with a, a living writer yet. No. Is there another question? Well, I have a piece of, very small piece of advice that I really believe in, and it, it'll sound a little nasty, but it's really honest and true. If you're a foreigner, that is to say, if you were not born, if you didn't take in English with your mother's milk, I do think you should have a friend check out your okay. translation. I know really intelligent people who are dedicated translators and who have published translations where after the first paragraph, I couldn't go on. And these are friends. I couldn't read any further. A, a sentence like, I had known him since seven years. I just stopped reading. German. And it was a really interesting novel. Yes. I had known him since seven years. But I'm a, I'm a, give me a break. And, and all, all, all she had to do was ask her husband, and she didn't bother to do it. You've got to check with a native speaker, even if you came here when you were 16 years old. And this is not an attack on an individual. It's the nature of language. You will never get all the prepositions right if you didn't take it in with your mother's milk. Yes. Oh, My yeah. students don't. They were born here. Well, yeah. <laughs> Another question? So it's hopeless for them. Another anecdote. Well, you can order books from France. Yeah. <laughs> I would also. It's just a postage problem. Yeah, it's just I have yeah, it shipped over. I would also. Um, we're talking about strange little resources. I think people don't uh, use interlibrary loan enough. I mean, there's almost no book that cannot be gotten to you by interlibrary loan, um, especially when you're first just thinking, well, I don't know if I really want it to, to do this. Um, I actually, the, Cersei Maya, this poet that I'm translating in Uruguay, she has nine books. She doesn't have copies of all of them. And when I went down, she, wow. she's, so she has this, because they often print quite limited editions, and she's just a person who gives them away. And so they had published her collected works, but I, I managed to get a copy of one of the original books, and I saw that they justified them all on the left margin. Right? They had knocked out some original spacing. So I went down to Uruguay thinking I would go to the National Library and look at them there, and they didn't have all their books. And I got back to the University of Wisconsin, and I put in a request for interlibrary loan, and they looked and looked and looked, and slowly they all came to me. Um, somewhere in this country, there was a copy of every single one of those poetry books. God knows how they got here, which I then could scan and have forever. Um, Yeah, right. right. Yes, mm -hmm. that's you the one. You can yeah. immediately see if there's a library nearby you. That's right. If you want to walk over there, <laughs> you can get mm. a copy. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, was there a question on this back other table? Good. Yeah, yeah, I have one. Um, it has to do with like, finding your genre and the difficult subject of figuring out whether you're good at it or not. Because what I have found, if you want to use the relationship metaphor, is that I have really poor taste in like, it's not both, really, but I have four days in, in literature, and I'll find something and, like, fall in love with it, and I'll start working on it, and then I'll get a few pages into it and go, this is just 
awful. This is not working. And then it's really hard to break up with it because it's like, I, just, I suck at this. So then how do you go about finding what you're good at, basically? Do you mean the translation isn't good, or you fall out of love with the original text? The translation is not good. So, like, how do you find something that you? So, when that happens, how do you kind of get out of it and find something that you both really like and? I think it's like I think it's like love. I mean, is that metaphor again? It's try, try again. Yeah, there, keep, keep there at it. There are many keep things that it. I love. So, this anthology I did of younger Uruguayan poets, you know, I picked out all 22 poets. I only translated one, and all the other translators are wandering around the Alta, basically. And there are people who took on stuff that I couldn't have done ever. Because Jeff Brock did some stuff in form for me. So there's another person who writes in Portunol. I couldn't translate that. There's someone else who did language poetry. I mean, I, you know, I picked them out. I could read them in Spanish, but I couldn't translate them. So um, I think people often do fall in love with a poet. I, I just do poetry. And so I don't know about the prose. And then when you sit down, you actually just you know, loving it and being able to translate it can be two different things. And I, I, just, I think you just go, well, okay, I learned something, and, and you move on and try and find something else. But, but if you really love it, mm -hmm. I will keep working at it. Oh, see, that's a good because, other approach. Because, <laughs> you know, I mean, with a, like, as in a relationship, mm -hmm. this is a tough marriage, but yeah. I really, really love this person. And what you will do is just learn so much. You will learn so much from getting, I have translated poems that were really easy to translate. Really easy. Uh, but I didn't learn anything. Yeah. And I didn't end up caring a whole lot, you know. But poems that are hard, they're really tough where you have things to solve. I mean, that to me, I mean, it's also when I write my own poems, but, but that to me is one of the joys of doing this, is, is, is sort of getting to the point of making something work that was really hard. So I would, unless you've got some other reason, I, I would keep at it for a while. <laughs> I would also say, again, from my not nearly as you know, baby experience compared to Alexis, is that when you work on someone, as you, the more you work on them, the easier they get to be for you. That's true. So, you know, there are 400 pages mm -hmm. of Cerce Maya's poetry, mm -hmm. and every poem I did was easier than the previous right. poem. Because I just began to learn what she does in a poem. I learned her vocabulary. I just began to think like she does. Which is the same thing that happens when you read a writer. You know, the more you read, and that's of course what translation is. Let's face it, it's good reading. It's yeah. good reading. That's really all it is. And the more you read, the more you know. It's reading while vocalizing, though. Sorry. It's reading while vocalizing. Uh, I, I think I think I don't nearly vo vocalize nearly enough. I'm going to have to do, do <laughs> more of this. Literally, you're vocalizing in another yeah. language. Yeah. Yeah. Translate. That's what you're told never to do as a child reader. Yeah. But in, in a sense, it was just, I don't know why, it came with some, something I was reading the other day about vocalizing or sub-vocalizing the language, you know, kids reading. And I said, you yeah, know, as a translator, you're sort of going back to the, what you're never, you're, I, and I work collaboratively all the time, but I'm sort of going between the two languages by now. But I'm, I've got to hear it, and I've got to somehow say it oh, yeah. in a way in English. And I, I want to say too easy is often Real yeah. Yes. To be tr the hardest thing is to be transparent. Yes. Sometimes. Yes. And, and to make the line work and the yes. phrase work and to match the kind of transparency that, that is there in the original. The easiness can, can be a trap. Yeah, I, and I guess what when I said easy, I didn't mean the kind of, I know what kind of easy you mean. Yeah, but, I, I figured that. Uh, because some of the, I mean, I, one of the first people I, fooled around with was, was Neruda, and, and the odes seem like the easiest thing in the world, and they're horrible, because if you just sort of follow line by line, it just doesn't come out right at all, and so I know what you mean. I think when I mean easy, it's like, would you translate this poem for me? Here's an assignment. I don't care about the poem. Um, maybe I'm missing something, but yeah. I think one other point, once you've done a couple of writers, you can network and find out about other yeah. writers. Right. This is very important. And the smaller the culture, that's more. And the, the smaller the culture, either you're going to get somebody who doesn't like any other writer, and you'll never hear a good word about other writers, or a couple honest people say, you ought to look at this person, you ought to read that person, you ought to consider that other person. And, and this is a tremendously productive way from within the culture that you're translating from, within the language, and a particular native uh, version of the language you're translating from to get a sense of what other um, sincere, yeah, good and sincere writers think 
what other writers would be going to turn to. And that, that's been very yeah. difficult. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think one word that we haven't used, that none of us up here have used, is voice. Uh, if you're tra translating poetry, I like talking about it as music and so on. Mm -hmm. But if you're translating fiction, I think sound still matters. But when you're doing a 380-page book, I think it's the voice of the author that you've got to capture. And certainly, I've done very little fiction. But in the case of Lee Spector, it was her voice I wanted to capture. It was the voice of a person who is so confident that all us human beings are in the same boat, that we're all lovelyly doomed people, and she just tells it the way it is, and she has complete confidence that if she speaks directly from her heart, unmediated, almost, almost, by thought, that we will understand her, that she will get through to us. She believes in this so thoroughly. That was the voice I tried to capture. It took me many years in, in, in the only respect of books that I did. Uh, so voice is a good thing to think about if some of you are doing fiction. Of course, of course, a poet should have a voice too. But in fiction, you have to. Because what will be your guideline in fiction? It cannot just be the content. Without style, then it, it isn't literature. Content alone cannot make literature. Another person? I guess I saw another hand up. The side of the room has not raised their hands at all. Um, the school teacher in me wants to call on someone in the side of the room. They haven't done their homework. They haven't done their homework. <laughs> well, I'm kind of in the middle, so I'll... Yeah, okay. I'll okay, take, uh, take responsibility. Um, well, I, as much as I agree that uh, I would much... Well, I, I prefer to, to travel uh, and get to know uh, writers. Uh, I also have to agree with what you said, uh, Jesse, um, in, in terms of... Uh, stalking contemporary writers on social media um, because I, right now I've got a project that's going to come out in January and I hadn't heard of half the writers that I'm including in this in this issue and uh, now I'm friends with all of them on Facebook. It was really easy to just shoot them an email and say, hey, I want to use your short story for this thing and they were delighted and, and now there's a lot of dialogue and then they're sending me stuff and yeah, it's, it's, so it's a lot. I think it's, it's really neat now, uh, even though I it, it took me forever to get on Facebook and now I addicted, so I, I agree with that point, that uh, it's really easy to, to connect with writers that way. Now, at this moment in Orderway, I think the Orderway writers are more in love with Facebook than people here. They're a little bit behind us, but they're all on Facebook. And, um, and Skyping, of course, is another possibility. And it's like, so if I want to talk with a poet about something, their poem, and I'm not in Orderway, and um, instead of you know, shooting endless emails back and forth, again, this would be in Spanish, talking about what they mean in Spanish, it didn't work into Skype. So that's another way in which the world has gotten smaller. I have to say, Serge Maya at 82 is a great emailer, but she doesn't Skype, so um, I haven't gotten that, gone that far, but um, it's, it's a smaller world. I have to say that you know, Serge Maya is 82, and she will not talk to me about her poetry. We have lovely, luminous times together in which she likes to read my poetry, which is in English, or talk about, if I take her a literary magazine that her stuff in, read anyone else's poems, or talk about Shakespeare, or her garden, or my kids, but she just will not talk about her poetry. And I think she has always been that way about her things, that she doesn't have much ego about them. She just lets them out in the world. And I also think she thinks at 82 she doesn't. And I was like, <laughs> so um, she says, you know, lovely things about how much my translations mean and how it's this, you know, the most important thing about the book is it's a bridge between us. Um, but, you know, I can ask her a question about something, but it's, it's sort of like chasing her down the hall to get her to say something about what she meant in a poem. So. I, I haven't had the sort of living mm -hmm. collaborator experience there. With the younger poet I was working with, he used so much street slang. You know, I would ask everyone and I knew, and then I would finally ask him um, because I would say, this person is not a ten seller standing on the corner, so what is he selling? You know, what kind of drugs is he selling? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so um, in that case, you know. And I have another poet I've translated in her 70s, Tatiana Oroño, and she makes up words. And people who do that, you know, I wandered around all day. I Googled the heck out of a title for one of his poems is M-A-D-R-O-R, -R, Madaror. And I thought, is it someone's name? Is it a reference to a, you know, another lit bit of literature? It doesn't seem to have anything to do with the poem, I, as far as I could tell. I wandered around, I asked every Uruguayan I saw for two weeks. It's uh, finally, I'm going to ask Tatiana. And it's Madre and Dolor put together. Well, of course you should ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. It was just, I, I didn't ask her because at that time her mother was sick and I didn't get a chance to ask her. But I, I was just setting this out like a task for myself. Surely I can figure this out. There is no way you can figure this out. Now, I have to say also, I'm not sure that any other, any Spanish speaker would ever have known that either. So, so how did you render it? 
You know, I actually haven't finished that poem yet. I now know what the title means, but I, it's just sitting there going. Very hard. Yeah, Very hard. Yeah, yeah. She's, she's one of those dating things yet. I've translated some of her poems which have been published individually, and she's quite a hard poet, and I, I'm trying to think maybe that if that's my next project to do a whole book or whether we're just going to leave it with a few poems. I have to say that I have not, I'm like many poets, I don't like to talk about my poems. I mean, if you can't figure out what my poem is, too bad. But this experience of working with Vietnamese uh, happened at the same time that I was being translated into Italian. And it really made me very generous with my translators mm. uh, to have the experience of having Vietnamese tell me I, s I suddenly opened up. And, and in the same way that a poet would tell me a story behind a poem that had nothing to do with the translation, but at least I knew where it came from, I found myself telling my translator uh, more about my poems than I <coughs> ever told anyone. And uh, it was useful to have it be working both ways. Anybody? We have more anecdote time. We could let Alexis <laughs> give us another anecdote. There's oh. a hand over there. I was just wondering if any of you have ever had the experience of wanting to translate someone, but also not wanting to have a terribly personal relationship with them. Yeah. And is that possible? <laughs> Do you know? Um, <laughs> Well, I want to say that, Alex, that, that Augustine Lucas, the, the younger poet that I did for this anthology, is now the only one I haven't met because he's a professional football player and he has been in Argentina and I haven't met him. So there's, I know everyone else. We spent a considerable amount of time hanging out. Um, another friend of mine here was just saying, uh, having done a book with someone who they ended up being psychologically troubled and very difficult. Yes. So I think that's an example of it. Yes, mm -hmm. I have a friend. <laughs> Maybe the same um, friend. Um, <laughs> so there must be. Have you, have, have, it doesn't sound like you've done that, Alexis. Like you've had someone you really. Yeah, I, I did a book with a person who was psychologically troubled, but it didn't interfere until uh, half a year, until months after the book was published. So the only interference is we'll never say a word, we'll never speak to each other again. I absolutely hate her. Um, <laughs> but uh, I went, I went, I went down to Ecuador. And I, I bought this cover. I, I paid for this beautiful Goya on the cover. Um, my publisher was dedicated to the book. I was dedicated to the book. I got all the poems in magazines all over the country. I brought 100 copies down. And I, I'm a weak old guy. I brought 100 copies down in my luggage to Ecuador because we had scheduled three major readings in the three biggest cities in the country. And at the first reading, she said, just en passant, oh, by the way, I've canceled the other two readings. <laughs> with no, no excuse. She just got a new job and she didn't have the time to worry about them. So, um, and then of course you afterwards you find out that, that, uh, that she's a very difficult person. Um, working with her, I already knew she was difficult, but, the, but you know, she, she uh, was a real poet and uh, I uh, thought it was worth it. Uh, but of all the people, I did 17 people for the anthology, she was the only one who was a, a, a problem. She arrived two and a half hours late, completely hungover, uh, had spent the entire night drinking. And so I gave her a buck, and I said, cross the street, get yourself a coffee, come back in half an hour. I was very severe, and well, she's 23 or 24. At the time, was 25. She went across the street, drank a cup of coffee, came back, and worked all afternoon with me, and we got it done. So, uh, but I don't think I will ever talk to her again. Everybody else, uh, I got along with um, very well. The most famous, I think, the best living poet in Portugal today, I have never met. Uh, he's sort of a bit of a recluse, but very nice. He wrote me a letter after reading my translation saying, oh, you know, it's, it's flattery, of course, but still, one likes flattery. He wrote me a letter saying, uh, oh, he's so better than the original. Um, What's the name of the poet? Alberto Elder. He's really great. I offered it to New Directions, and the remark was the usual remark, poetry won't sell. Um, so eventually I, I will publish him somewhere, but I don't know where. I've been sitting on this book now for 11 years. And uh, he's really great. He's still alive. He's almost dying, but he's alive. And I've never met him. But I had the fortune, the good fortune, 11 years ago, my, the woman in Montreal was still in this country. She had not joined the UN yet. And she's terrific. So I did all of my Eberto Elda with her help. I could never have done it on my own. He's the wild man of Portuguese poetry. The opposite of Eugenio de Andrade, who is this lucid, 
transparent little stream with little shiny stones in it, and you simply have to say it right, but there's not much to talk about. Now, now the side of the room is coming alive. I see a hand. Well, actually, this is a reaction to your question. Uh -huh. I, uh, I'm wondering if you had in mind that you didn't want to be influenced by the uh, writer. No, I have a particular person in mind who uh, I would like to translate him, but he also makes me terribly uncomfortable. <laughs> he makes you feel terribly uncomfortable? Yes. <laughs> but he's very nice, but like too nice, kind of. Yeah, that's a particular yeah. problem. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, 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 I never had that. Nobody ever comes. Me. <laughs> we should probably. Yeah. This is no, we could still go to five. We've got a couple. We've got five more minutes. Yeah. We yeah. Yeah. Close to five, right? Any of one of you, Thanks, if you fine. happen to come here at the moment, Tell us. Sure. I'm working with the poet, you okay. are supposed, supposed, supposed to go to five. I know. I know. Sorry. At the end of it, you really believe opposite things about how a certain thing is to be translated. But when I'm talking about the translator himself or herself, there's very strong conviction about the choice. How do we deal with that problem, if you have had it? Well, once, it only happened to me once, and uh, I finally said to the poet, listen, your English is pretty good, but you have to, either you trust me as your translator or you don't. I can't go on working like this. And after that, everything was fine. That's what happened. The one time, she was correcting every little word, and she was wrong, you know, 90% of the time. Uh, correcting my prepositions, you know, real bullshit. And I think she just was irritated. This is the woman whom I had abandoned because she went to Greece. I felt she abandoned me. Um, and uh, so she, after that, allowed me to translate her, but she was very stickily, and it was only personal. And I finally said, I can't work like this. And then it was OK. But if you really, if the other person really interferes, yes, I think that finally you have to say, I'm, I'm the translator, English is what I'm doing. If you see that I've made a mistake, in your opinion, with the original, tell me. But you have to trust my English. Yeah. It happened to me where a lot of people, there's a certain point I translated, they want me to do a complete book of the guys. He wanted final approval of the text. In English? In English. I told him I won't give it, it's a deal breaker, and I didn't do it. Yeah, no, that's what I would do. If I were you, I would do exactly. I think that. we've got time for like one more comment. We want to be, be able to get. Well, we want to be able to get yeah, over we'll to the five. to the five five, five o'clock reading for the Alta Fellows. So let's, let me one more question. Well, well, I was just going to say, kind of in response to your question about not wanting to get too close, and then also, you know, if you have got somebody with a big disagreement. Um, last year's Alta, I read a few poems from a really good friend of mine, and I was translating them, and that's a difficult situation because I'm really close friends with him. And every time he would come up with all kinds of little changes and we'd be in disagreement about poems all the time. And I was already too close, you know, because he's we lived together for a while. And I was like, better I drop it. You know, you have to. Maybe before this person that close, you gotta say, look, there's gotta be this kind of these, these ground rules about how this can work because I have to have ownership of this project. And then also once you're already too close, you gotta say, look, there's a decision that has to be made. And Well, I, I actually have a, a, an instructive, un, unfortunate little tale. My, my mother's a trans. My mother's dead. My mother was a translator and spent much of her life translating her husband. My stepfather was a Russian writer, but he was a man of great uh, ego, and uh, he was a bully, and he was a very nasty, tough man, and a very good writer. And his English never was good. My mother's English was exceptionally good. He would hover over her because they lived together. And he would argue over every comma. And finally, after they, th three or four or five of his books were translated into English and were published, my, my mother finally quit. Yeah. She didn't leave the marriage. She said, I'm not going to translate you anymore. And the poor guy started writing in English. <laughs> and, well, he had lived in America for many, many years, but his English could never have the verve, the variety, or even the humor that his Russian had. And so, in a way, he became an emasculated writer because he was so nasty to his translator. Yeah. 
I, I do think if you can have the power lines clear, it isn't always true, especially if you're doing translation for hire. But like I'm the editor of the anthology that has you know 22 poets and 22 translators, and the um, and sometimes the poets the, tran the poets knew me, but they didn't always know their translator, and they were just meeting them. They would take the translation that they got in the English translation from the translator and show it to a friend who spoke English, and they uh -huh. come back to me with That's concerns. A disaster. And I would just say, look. I'm going over every single translation. No translation will go into the anthology that I'm not absolutely certain is good. You just have to trust me. And yeah. no, I'm not making these changes. So, um, and I don't even want you to tell your translator about it. <laughs> so, but the, beware of the friend who speaks a little English. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right, that's, right, the, right. that's the thing. Absolutely. Thank you. You guys were great. Yeah. Thanks.